Well, it's 200 years since the death of Captain Arthur Phillip, who was the first governor of New South Wales and the man who really set up modern Australia. I've always been fascinated by him. There's some very interesting new thinking, though, about how he interacted with the first Australians, with the Aboriginal people of the area. And Grace Carskins, who's an Associate Professor of History at the University of New South Wales, is joining me now. She delivered a very interesting paper at a seminar recently to mark this big bicentenary of Captain Arthur Phillip. And I'm delighted to welcome her. Grace Carskins, uh, welcome to Saturday Extra. Oh, thank you, Geraldine. Good to be here. Now, um, Arthur Phillip's official instructions were to deal very well, very nicely nicely with the Aboriginal people of Sydney Cove. Was that a predicted thing? I understand that um, other governors and captains of the British Empire were told to, you know, be nice to the natives. Uh, That didn't always happen, so the orders are different from reality. But I do think in Philip's uh, case, he genuinely thought and believed that that would be uh, not only possible, but he believed it was the right thing to do. He and the officers were remarkably enlightened in that way. He was a man of the Enlightenment. He wasn't. They were. They all were. And they saw themselves as gentlemen and civil and polite and, you know, uh, and they were always also fascinated by the era people. They wanted to learn about them. They thought they would be simple and childlike and cowardly and run away and not curious. Those were Banks and Cooks's word. And they had either forgotten what had happened to them or downplayed it because that is nothing like what the Eora were like. They, Inga Clendenin calls their culture a fierce warrior culture. They were not like children and, you know, the problem was that Philip tried to treat them like that. And he was taken aback, wasn't he, at the, to see so many strong armed men when he sailed in, um, shouting belligerently from the clifftops, as you write, to see 20 Camaragal warriors of impressive physique wading out to meet the boat at Kayami. Yes, uh, at Manly. <laughs> at, at Manly. <laughs> That's right. We have to try and think of it through twin lenses. One, we have to think of it through the British view, Mm. what they knew, what they expected, what they wanted to do. But we also have to think about the Eora side. What did they expect? How did they treat strangers? And from the Eora side, the first thing you want to know, well, first you do the warning, like Mm. we're fierce, watch out. But the next thing you want to know is what sex are these people, these strangers? What do they want and what sex are they? Because in Eora society, men deal with men. That's important. And so when Philip finally realised what they wanted to know, because these guys, you know, these strangers had no sex organs, you couldn't see them, they had no beard, so were they women or were they men? Philip finally got it and said, oh, okay, and he ordered a, sol- a, a sailor to drop his pants and then all the Eora warriors went, oh, we're dealing huge, with men. they're men, okay, <laughs> we can now negotiate. When did the Eora people, and you're, that's the great tribe of the Sydney region, but you're using that in a broader sense, that well, term, Well, the original na- word Eora... It's different now, but the original word just means people. And we use it for the people of the coastal area because that was their name for people. Yes. When did they realise that the English weren't leaving, that they were planning to set up a permanent agricultural settlement Mm -hmm. and not planning to return to England as Banks and Cook had? had, That's right. That's probably what they were expecting. Uh, Probably after about three months. And so what they did was try to quarantine them in Sydney Cove or Warrain was the original name. Um, And so whenever they, the convicts or others, went outside that area, they they would throw warning spears at them, which actually caused some of the early um, shootings. We have this story about Philip's behaviour at Sydney Cove and his dealings with Bennelong and this sort of real effort to be very... um, I was going to say civilised. That's a very bad word. In this. <laughs> I won't use that. But you very can use it from pleasant. one side, but maybe not the other. <laughs> very pleasant behaviour. Yeah. But then there is seem to be striking contrasts in the race relations up the river in Parramatta during the same time Philip was governor. Philip was commissioned with setting up an agricultural colony and it was it's a huge social experiment. In some ways it was um, humane because you're giving these people who had no hope in England a better future, trying to give them farms, give them everything they needed for farms. But to make farms, you need land. And by the time Philip had figured out where the good soil was to found the farms, he knew that Aboriginal warriors were not childlike and would not disappear. They were fierce and they were determined. And so what he did with Parramatta was there were no, as you said, there were no kind of conciliatory gestures, there were no kidnappings, there were nothing. He sent, it was an undisguised invasion. He sent in soldiers to guard um, he armed the, the convict settlers with muskets, um, which sounds very cruel and savage, uh, and it was, but Philip was told to set up this colony and he knew that those settlers would have no hope without being armed. And didn't Benelong come to him and say, my people are very upset about what's happening? It wasn't Benelong, oh. it was Mulgren, who was from the Baramatagal um, 
tribe at Parramatta. But they also thought they had someone on their side in Philip, mm. didn't they? So they yes. is that correct to yes. say? Uh, his reputation had probably um, spread out because, you know, Eora and Aboriginal communication lines are very, very quick. So everything he did would have spread around through the networks. And so Morgan obviously decided that uh, he, he was a man to go and see. And this is the first official Aboriginal protest in 1790 in uh, Australia. And he went to see Philip. But see, the story is, the end of the story is that Philip ignored him. He just took down the notes, said, oh, well, they're going to have to move on and reinforced the um, the soldiers out at Parramatta. Yes, like you write, that Philip knew that farms meant dispossession and dispossession meant violence. So in other words, we are entitled to draw the conclusion that Philip, oh, are we? That Philip played at being the Enlightenment man for a while until they resisted and then he just came down with the full force of the British Empire. He did. Do we now judge him morally? Do we say he's a good guy or a bad guy? As a historian, that's not my approach. I believe that it's more important to try and explain his situation, the context of what he's doing, which is much more complicated than making a moral judgment. Um, I think if, you know, if things had been different, if maybe the Aboriginal people had been agriculturalists already, maybe something else would have happened. But it was naked dispossession and he mm. knew it and his heart would have sunk about it, I think. Um, and he did what well, he had to do. So. <laughs> well, we hope so. But we all, I mean, for his part, he didn't want to have any disasters. Imagine if the news had got back to England that his first farms, everyone had been slaughtered. You know, that's not what Philip wanted. Um, then you would I'm, have had them descending and possibly, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the thing about the Eora is they are so restrained. They, they just warn them. They could have killed all of them, really. They actually made a room for them in Warrain. They started treating them as part of their legal system. Um, they were actually quite generous, and in the end, uh, didn't work out for yeah, them. They did were it. grossly out. They just weren't in the same weapons category, were they? That's actually debatable because muskets are actually deadly, but they're also really inaccurate. Whereas spears are deadly accurate. If they'd wanted to hit Philip when they speared him, they could have killed him, but they didn't. So spears are deadly accurate. They are showing some restraint. But the point is what the new thinking, like Manning Clark wrote that, mm. in effect, it was instant disaster yeah. once the British arrived for mm. the Aboriginal people. And you're saying the newer thinking is, no, that's not the case at all. You're sort of presenting this much more nuanced view. Yes, which started with Inga Clendenin's book. But I think she, saw, she went back too far the other way and emphasised the friendliness. Well, we can't forget the guns. You know, the guns are actually mm. the backbone of this. And used as a threat rather more than... Um, actually hitting people because it was actually quite hard to hit people. And it takes a long time to actually put your gunpowder back in the gun. So they used to do it behind their hands so the Aborigines couldn't see because they didn't want their mystique of guns to be destroyed. It's quite funny and horrible at the same time. What were they, what are they, fire sticks they called them? In the Aborigine they called them fire, well their word is jirubba which yeah. is fire sticks and they started calling the whites jirubbas because obviously the guns are what really struck them. I must say I didn't realise until you pointed out that the yield of this was that Aboriginal people, you know, kept living for quite a long time in the settlement of Sydney. Absolutely, yes. Side by side. Yes, but yes. Melbourne's history of mm. early race relations was very different to the experience at Sydney Cove, yes. wasn't it? Why? Yes. Well, the whole of Victoria was invaded and taken over and, and was awfully violent in about four years. So Melbourne's kind of it grows very, very quickly. And they don't have the conciliatory gestures. There's no Philip there at least trying to make an effort to get to know Aboriginal people, to invite them into the city and to say, no, they have a right to be here. They've been invited. They were immediate had regulations made against them. They were banished out of the city constantly. Um, this is according to the latest history. Maybe, maybe there's a more nuanced story under that. I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on that, but that's the impression you get. Now, with Sydney, that Eora presence and other Aboriginal people presence in Sydney goes on and the law, Aboriginal law, is carried out in Sydney in the contest ground at Hyde Park at least into the 1820s. Really? Um, yes, for Aboriginal people. Um that's where the Anzac Memorial 40 is. Years. Yeah. This is a chapter of Sydney's history we've forgotten. We actually were a white Eora town at the beginning. And lots of other people too, Islanders and Indians and lots of people in Sydney. We're not a white settlement. Well, Grace Caskins, thank you so much indeed for introducing this very different nuanced view of Arthur Phillip. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> 